In this module, we will again look at long-term memory, but we're going to focus on individuals and groups with exceptional memories. And this is, I think, a really interesting topic. So when I say exceptional memory, I actually mean this in the, the widest uh, meaning of the definition of exceptional, and that's both unusually superior and unusually inferior. So in terms of superior long-term memory, we'll look at savant syndrome, and we'll look at highly superior autobiographical memory. And in terms of inferior, we'll look at the opposite of HSAM, which is severely deficient autobiographical memory. And we'll also look at a type of dementia, specifically Alzheimer's disease. So first off, savant syndrome. So this is someone with mostly inferior cognitive abilities and one or occasionally a few superior cognitive abilities. The reason for the inferior cognitive abilities is most commonly autism spectrum disorder, but uh, that's the case in, in, in about 50% of the instances of savant syndrome, but there can be other reasons for it as well. Uh, one fascinating, fascinating way is it can occur following a brain injury. So there's a video on YouTube, I forget the title of it now, but there's an individual who's you know just a normal guy, and then he has a brain injury, I can't remember exactly what happened, and all of a sudden he's a mathematical uh, genius. And you may have heard of these instances before, and, and uh, it's, it's one uh, way that savant syndrome occurs. Now, when I say superior cognitive abilities, I'm sure some of you have superior cognitive abilities. You know, you might be really good at, at math or science or, or kinesiology. Uh, so that's the typical case where it's, you know, it's a superior cognitive ability, but, you know, you know, maybe nothing to write home about. Very rarely, the superior cognitive abilities are extraordinary. So beyond, well, not beyond compared to anyone else, but, you know, very unique. And this, uh, this type of savant syndrome uh, is estimated to only be in about 100 currently living individuals. So these individuals are rare. One example of this uh, was depicted in the film Rain Man. And it's an older film uh, from 1988, won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1989. So a very... Um, prestigious film, very well-known film, but I, I'm not quite sure of, of your generation if this will be something that you've seen because it is, uh, it was probably released uh, before you were born. And even for me, you know, when it, I didn't see it when it came out, you know, I was seven, I think, <laughs> around seven or, or eight or maybe six. <laughs> let's, let's go with eight. Uh, no, seven. <laughs> Anyways, you can obviously tell that my long-term memory is not exceptional. Uh, but in it, they depict um, Dustin Hoffman plays a character uh, with autism who has some extraordinary abilities. And the individual that kind of motivated this story, so the, the story is not a historical or uh, autobiographical account of this individual's life, specifically uh, Kim Peek, who you can see there, the, the one in the picture not with Tom Cruise. Um, fascinating individual with savant syndrome. And um, the, the writer of the film met him at, at some point and was kind of inspired to create this, um, this, this, this story where they, they took him kind of to the extremes. Uh, but it, so it was loosely based on his interactions with, with Kim Peek. We're not going to talk about uh, Kim. We're going to talk about Stephen Wiltshire, another individual with savant syndrome. I think the best way to introduce him is for you to, to watch a video about Stephen. So this video is about 45 minutes long. The link is in the description uh, of this video. So give me a pause and go and check out uh, Stephen. So Stephen w Wiltshire, incredibly talented artist. Now, you might be wondering, does he have a photographic memory? You've probably heard that term used in popular culture. And no, uh, his memory is not photographic. He, what he remembers isn't 
uh, a, an exact image or like a video that he's replaying in his head. It's still a schema, but his schema is far more detailed than the schema that you or I would make. And you can see that you know he takes a a 15 minute helicopter ride and he can cre uh, recreate these these this fantastic level of detail. And even if you or I studied uh, a videotape of that 15 minute flight for months, we still wouldn't remember the amount of detail that he did in just a single viewing. So he has a phenomenal memory. The other thing that uh, combines to make him a great artist is he also has extraordinary artistic ability. Because even if you had a great memory, if he could only draw like I could, you know, he would not be a famous artist. So he has kind of these two islands of, of talent. He's extremely artistic and he has this incredible memory and they combine in a really fascinating uh, way. So Stephen is a, a great example of an autistic savant. With other uh, autistic savants, um, or people with savant syndrome, sorry, that's another term that, that's often used um, for people that specifically um, have these abilities and um, uh, uh, fall somewhere on the autism spectrum disorder, but not everyone uh, falls, uh, is, um, has that form of, of issues with their, their cognitive abilities. Anyways, um, a lot of people with savant syndrome also have exceptional memories, um, but um, their skills can be in, in all sorts of other categories. Um, one common thing is to be able to calculate um, any, uh, any date to know what day of the year that is. And um, we'll see that again later, but it's kind of for a different example. Uh, other things is, is some people with savant syndrome might be phenomenal musicians. Um, so there's a, a lot of variety to, to what is, is seen in Savant Syndrome. Okay, our next example of exceptional memory is called Highly Superior Autobiographical Memory. Now these in individuals are able to recall um, with considerable accuracy details of daily experiences that occurred over many previous de decades. So their memory, their, their episodic uh, or their, their facts, um, declarative long-term memory, it's still a schema, but it's, it's exceptionally detailed in, in a similar way to uh, Stephen Wiltshire's long-term memory was exceptional detail. But for these individuals, it's specific to just their episodic or their memory of events of their life. Their fact, their declarative memory facts um, is no different than you or I. So it's just their, their, their autobiographical memory. So take a look at this video. It's about 14 minutes long and you'll see uh, three of these individuals uh, and they'll, they'll explain what, what it's like to have highly superior autobiographical memory. So, as we saw, uh, they have considerable uh, intricate details of decades of their life, which is just phenomenal. I mean, I have trouble uh, remembering yesterday and remembering, you know, minute details from yesterday, like, what did I have for lunch from yesterday? You know, I don't know, it's gone. But these individuals have incredible memories for, for decades of their life. Now, what this supports is that long-term memory for events and facts are separate. So within declarative memory, we have our events and we have our facts. And so far we knew that declarative memory was different from non-declarative memory. And the evidence there came from amnesia. But now we also have evidence that events and facts are stored differently because one of these stores with these individuals is improved. Their uh, event memory is phenomenal, but their fact-based memory is just like anyone else. In the end of the video, they talked a bit about the research into the brain structures, and the video kind of made it sound like they, they, they had figured things out, but it's complicated. And I would really say that it's so far inconclusive. So they, they found 
quite a few people um, with highly superior autographical bio, biographical memory after Jill Price and after some of the news stories where other people said, you know, I, I think I have this too, and, and they were tested, and, and a lot of them did, or some were, you know, superior autobiographical memory, but maybe not highly superior. Uh, but there, you know, there's fewer than 60 of these individuals, so there's a, a good number, and they've done some MRI, fMRI research, and sometimes one individual, uh, a certain area will be bigger, and, and then in someone else, maybe it's a different area, or maybe that same area is smaller. So at, so far, I'd say it's you know kind of uh, inconclusive. And one conclusion that they're maybe inching towards is that well, because all there's all this variety in the structure. Maybe it's not the brain's structure, maybe it's how well the brain is interconnected. Uh, and that is something you don't see um, necessarily on, uh, say, an, an fMRI, at least the, the functional, the F part of that. Uh, or uh, maybe it's not the connectivity, maybe it's the brain function itself. So maybe you have the same amount of neurons, but those neurons, for whatever reason, are firing differently. And that's kind of even harder to see. Ooh, one last thing I wanted to say about this is it's really interesting the dichotomy between, say, uh, Mary Lou and uh, Jill. Uh, so Mary Lou, you know, she loves this. She thinks it's a great gift. There's a, another individual, so it's not only women that, that have this condition. We saw three women in this clip, but there's um, a, a man who's in many other clips online, and he thinks this gift is great. And one reason he says is that he can go back and relive moments with people that have passed away. And he loves that, you know, despite that they're gone, he can vividly relive these moments. Um, so he, he thinks of this as a very positive thing. Whereas Jill, she's almost haunted by these memories. So on the other hand, imagine if, uh, imagine the pain of a particularly bad breakup. And one good thing about uh, our memory is that with time, uh, that memory fades. It's just not as vivid. But that that d does not occur nearly to the same degree in people with highly superior autobiographical memory. And with Jill, she can remember uh, the the almost the complete pain of of that memory um, as if it were yesterday, even if it's been you know two decades. So it may come down to personality. Uh, and and how the individual in, interprets this this unique ability. So as I mentioned on that last slide, what this shows us is that within declarative memory, yes, events and facts are different. They're stored uh, differently. This is another example of long-term memory being uh, having multiple stores because these individuals have a great event memory incredible, but their fact-based memory is, is just uh, is normal. It's just like you or I. All right, those are our examples of exceptional memory. Now let's talk about inferior memory. And one of the, the newer ones, even newer than highly superior autobiographical memory, is what they've labeled severely deficient autobiographical memory. And these individuals their symptoms are basically the opposite of, of Jill and um, Mary Lou and, and the people that we, we saw a moment ago. And then we'll talk about uh, Alzheimer's disease, another example of inferior uh, memory. So what is severely deficient autobiographical memory? Well, these individuals are unable to vividly recollect autobiographical experiences from their past. And uh, this is not caused by any sort of neuropathology. So it's not like anterograde amnesia uh, or retrograde amnesia where you have an injury and damage to your brain you know, causes a, an issue with, with long-term memory. These individuals, you know, we, we think that their brains are completely normal. They've always been completely normal. Uh, and yet they have a severely deficient autobiographical memory. Now, they do have some autobiographical memories. It's not to the extreme of uh, amnesia where you would have none, uh, but these memories are often vague and lack emotion. So these individuals, they have an absence of, of re-experiencing. So if I think about uh, my wedding, 
you know, I, I, I don't remember it like a videotape, but there are moments I remember quite well. And I remember, uh, you know, the joy and, and the happiness and, and the laughter. And, and I remember those emotions. And when I think about it, you know, it, it makes me happy. And, and I, I almost get to relive that uh, in a way. Um, so those memories to me are like, when I think about it, it's, it's like being in the first person. I, I, I'm somewhat transported there. Now, people with severely deficient autobiographical memory, they say their memories are almost like a third person perspective. So they can see it, but they don't relive it at all. And this um, has a dichotomy to it because unfortunately, you know, they don't relive that joy. So there is um, one of the first, I think maybe the first person to uh, present with this condition uh, Susie McKinnon, she remembers that she got married and she, they can say, well, you know, was it a joyful day? How did you feel? And she's like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that it was very happy, but she can't re-experience it. Um, so that's, that's unfortunate. You know, that's something she's missing out on. But on the other side of that, she also, uh, cannot, um, relive you know, sad moments in her life. So she'll remember that, say, a relative passed away. She might remember that she went to the funeral. But if she thinks back on it, um, it, it doesn't evoke any sadness for her. And in some ways, that, that could be good. Now, severely deficient autobiographical memory, uh, you know, it's probably been around forever, but it's only recently that, that scientists have have dis have studied uh, people with this or, or known that it's existed at all. And with um, highly superior autobiographical memory, there's, they've studied, well, there was a, a, an article from a few years ago that said 60 individuals, there's probably a few more than that now. With severely deficient autobiographical memory, they only have five people uh, that, that have this. So they've done, uh, they've looked at their brains, and there's some initial evidence from those, you know, five people, that they have a smaller hippocampus in the right hemisphere. So two interesting things there. First, hippocampus, obviously very important for, for memory and consolidation. So Henry Malaysen, his hippocampus removed and you know that resulted in his, his anterograde amnesia. So we know the hippocampus is important for memory. The second interesting thing with these individuals is, is it has to do with some, uh, potentially in a symmetry where the left hippocampus uh, seems to be a normal size but the right one is, is smaller. And in this case, you know, smaller, you know, might uh, be a problem. But this is based on five individuals. So it's, it's very tentative uh, conclusion at, at this point. All right, our last example of inferior memory is dementia, specifically Alzheimer's disease. Now, dementia uh, is not a, a specific, specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a group of symptoms associated with the decline in memory or thinking skills severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. And when it comes to um, which cognitive functions are affected, it's, it's quite broad. Uh, memory is very common. Communication and language, ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception, and as um, Alzheimer's disease progresses, um, you'll often see declines in all and even other abilities as well. So speaking about dementia, um, I think is can be quite a sensitive topic because it's very common and you likely have uh, close ties or experience with with people um, who have dementia. So for me, out of my four grandparents, three of them uh, lived um, in, into their older ages, and all three of my of those grandparents actually had uh, dementia. Uh, so my grandfather pictured there, he had Lewy body uh, disorder, and then both of my um, grandmothers uh, had Alzheimer's. Um, and actually, uh, my, my one grandmother pictured beside my grandfather is actually still alive, uh, she has Alzheimer's, and it, it's slowly progressing uh, as well. Um, so I, 
um, understand that that I know this is a, a sensitive topic and there are times where I'll, I'll talk about this you know maybe uh, quite dry with scientific detail but in other aspects um, I will uh, attempt to convey the, uh, the the burden that that Alzheimer's and, and other forms of dementia has on not only the individual but uh, the wide range of individuals that are um, connected with them. So there are many types of dementia, um, but the four most common uh, are Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the most common by far. Uh, then there's um, vascular dementia, and vascular means that it's caused by um, an issue with blood flow. So it could be you have a stroke, uh, and blood flow is restricted to the part of the brain, that area is then damaged, um, and your symptoms of dementia would be described as vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia is very similar to Alzheimer's, except Alzheimer's, as we'll see, are caused by amyloid beta protein and tau proteins, whereas Lewy body uh, are, call, are caused by the, um, I, I won't attempt to pronounce that, but uh, what, are, what are called Lewy bodies after the, the researcher who, who studied them. A very broad form of dementia is called frontal temporal dementia, and it just means that you have neuronal loss in the frontal, uh, uh, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, or both lobes. Um, so that that's very broad, and your symptoms could be wildly different depending on is it the frontal lobe, is it the temporal lobe, and where is it in those those lobes. The statistics on how um, the percentages of each type of dementia vary depending on uh, the, the report you're looking at, but one thing that seems to be common is the order, that Alzheimer's is by far the most common, followed by vascular, Lewy body, Lewy body frontal temporal, and then there's, there's actually other types of uh, dementia as well that are less common. So Alzheimer's disease is important to research uh, because it is one of the most costly diseases in the United States. And the estimate, obviously it's difficult to estimate, but that it costs the United States about $100 billion per year. And this would be a combination of costs, um, so uh, care for the individual, uh, medical treatment, uh, support network, but even indirect costs. So if um, a family member is caring for someone from Alzheimer's disease, maybe they have to quit their job, maybe they have to reduce their hours, and that has costs involved with it as well. Um, so this adds up to a lot of money, $100 billion a year. And that's so much money, you know, I've never had $100 billion, <laughs> so it's difficult to understand how much that is. So let me try to put that in perspective. So one way we can think about that is, what are the, the cash reserves of some of the of the largest US companies and I think this is from 2017 so a little bit out of date but Apple uh, has the largest cash reserve about 260 billion dollars so in other words they could pay for all the costs uh, of, of Alzheimer's disease for two and a half years uh, and then they would be out of money uh, and you know if even if you add up the money of all these comp companies they could only pay for the costs of Alzheimer's disease for you know, just a few years, maybe a decade, actually, I don't think it's going to be even that long, uh, and then they would all be bankrupt. Um, so this, this is a huge cost uh, to, uh, to society. If we think about it in terms of individuals, uh, if we again, this is same same year, 2017, so a little out of date, um, but uh, you can see Jeff Bezos, so the, the wealthiest uh, man in, uh, in the world, uh, his his net worth there at that time was was about 130 billion, so he could only afford the cost of Alzheimer's for for one year for for all of society, you know, and then he would he would be broke. Interesting note here about uh, Bezos, Gates, and and Buffett, uh, three Americans. If you combine their net worth, they have more wealth than half of the uh, of the U.S. population. Uh, so that's 160 billion people. Uh, have have an equivalent wealth of of these three individuals. Doesn't have anything to do with Alzheimer's. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that that interesting fact. So Alzheimer's, 
definitely a, a, a costly disorder um, in, in terms of, of, of financial, but it also has a huge uh, emotional burden on the individuals and the, the network of, of family and friends around them. So it's worthy of study for you know, both those reasons and more. Now currently there is no cure uh, for Alzheimer's disease, something that, that you're probably uh, aware of. Now it's classified as a neurodegenerative disease. So what happens is it typically starts slowly and it gets worse and worse over time. Um, so the d disease progresses um, you know, at its own rate and there's basically at this point nothing we can do to slow down that rate, to stop it, or, or better yet, to, to reverse it. Um, so it begins slowly, but as the damage accumulates, um, the, the symptoms uh, get worse and worse, and we'll, we'll look at that progression in a moment. At the beginning, it's so mild that it's difficult to distinguish from the symptoms of normal aging. But by the end, if an individual you know, lives for a long time with it, uh, then they can be completely dependent on care, um, you know, bedridden, can't even eat by themselves, things like that. Now in 2015, so again this is a little outdated, it was estimated that there were uh, 46 million people globally with dementia. Uh, so this is a, a, a sizable portion of the population. And again, which is one reason why it has such a big cost, you know, if, if only one person had this, it wouldn't have a, a huge cost to society. But unfortunately, many, many people have this. So how does Alzheimer's uh, progress? There are different models with different numbers of stages. Uh, we're going to look at one of the popular kind of four-stage models, where individuals go from pre-dementia to early to moderate to advanced. Now, putting classifying an individual is an in, inexact science because they, these are, are qualitatively assessed uh, stages. And the rate at one progress uh, can be vastly different between two people. And there's also individual differences. So you may have a lot of symptoms that are similar to early Alzheimer's, whereas you may have one symptom that is similar to most individuals with moderate Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, within these stages and, and how they're expressed in different individuals. But we'll talk about some of the, uh, the, the averages. So first of all comes pre-dementia. Now these initial symptoms are often mistakenly attributed to aging or stress because they're really indistinguishable from those sorts of things. So the early symptoms are things like difficult remembering uh, difficulty remembering recent information. You might forget important dates or events. You might ask someone for the same information uh, twice. And you, you might find that you increasingly need to rely on memory aids like, you know, um, a calendar or notes or family members to remind you of things. The challenge with that is those sorts of things also happen with stress. So if you can think about to the last exam period, uh, you may have had some of those symptoms. And were they pre-dementia? Likely not. They were probably just that you were stressed. Now those symptoms are also very common in aging. So as we age, uh, our brains uh, are not as, as good as they once were. And some of the early symptoms of aging are things like difficulty remembering recent information. So with uh, older individuals, a lot of them have these symptoms, but that doesn't mean that they're going to develop dementia. It just means that they're aging, or uh, it could mean that they're stressed, or it could mean both. So you, you are never actually diagnosed with pre-dementia. No, no medical professional will say you have pre-dementia because there's no way to differentiate pre-dementia from normal aging uh, or stress. What will happen is eventually your symptoms will get worse, and you'll have early dementia uh, or early Alzheimer's and that is distinguishable from normal aging because the symptoms are worse. So what does early Alzheimer's look like? Well these individuals can perform many tasks independently but may need assistance with the most cognitively demanding tasks and that will depend on the individual. So if a 
uh, someone who a tax uh, consultant uh, who worked in that field for years if they have early Alzheimer's they're not going to have trouble doing their taxes because for them that's not hugely cognitive demanding they know how to do that very well but someone else who has uh, early dementia or early Alzheimer's and they're trying to do their taxes for the first time ever that would be cognitively demanding and they might need help with that so people with early uh, Alzheimer's the good news is is that they are very independent now there are increased issues with remembering recent information and these are definitely more severe than typical aging so at this point a medical professional could say because of the severity of your issues remembering recent information we know that this is not typical aging this is not typical stress uh, that there's there's some sort of uh, issue some sort of dementia um, and the most common would be Alzheimer's disease. The issue with memory, more specifically, is transferring information from working memory to long-term memory. Uh, and, and that is more affected than memories that are already consolidated within long-term memory. And we're going to come back and, and look at that and the neurophysiology behind it. Something else that is seen are language problems. Uh, so they're mild at first. Uh, the individual might have a shrinking vocabulary, decreased word fluency, but not something that would be immediately obvious, uh, especially to someone who hasn't met them before. But if you know this individual quite well, and you know earlier in their life they were very eloquent, you might notice that their, their word choice is, is slightly more simple. Now the average age of, of early Alzheimer's is around 80 years old. And on average, um, people with early Alzheimer's will live for four to eight years after diagnosis, but some have lived for as long as 20 years. Now, Alzheimer's is not a fatal disease. Alzheimer's is not something uh, that will kill you. Um, but if you are 80 years old and you have early Alzheimer's, uh, most 80 year olds you know, might only live for four or eight years uh, more with or without Alzheimer's. Uh, so that's why um, one uh, people typically live for only 48 years after, but that is is probably pretty close to the normal lifespan uh, of an 80-year-old. And of course, some people live very long, and that's why you know you could be 80, have early Alzheimer's, and and live a normal life to 100, um, a normal lifespan to 100, but your Alzheimer's would probably be getting a little worse uh, each year. Although the rates uh, of decay can be uh, vastly different in, in different people. And it also isn't necessarily a linear progression. So it could, it could progress slowly for a while and then quicker and then slow down again. Um, it's, it's, it's not predictable. So in this video, I'd like you to, uh, to take a look at this. And this is um, a video made for kids where they meet a woman with Alzheimer's, but I think it's it's really great for for any audience to see um, what Alzheimer's is like. Now they don't say exactly which stage uh, of Alzheimer's this uh, woman has, but my guess it would be early Alzheimer's based on um, you know just the the casual description of her symptoms. But give me a pause, watch this video, and come back, and we'll we'll talk about it. So, uh, a few, just to note a few of the things we saw there. So this, uh, uh, this woman, she uh, lives on her own. So she is very independent. So that likely suggests that she's in, in the, the early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, so she mentioned using uh, Google Calendar, and that's very typical. So um, if you have trouble consolidating information from working memory to long-term memory, you can increasingly rely on uh, aids like uh, like Google Calendar. She did show some issues with remembering uh, recent information. So she forgot Crystal's name. Uh, she lost her train of thought uh, when discussing uh, genetics, for example. Now, language problems, because we don't know uh, this woman, I, I don't think we can say uh, that we can detect those, but maybe a lifelong friend of hers uh, might see that her language was a little bit different. 
So the issues with consolidating uh, information from working memory to long-term memory, well, we've seen this before. This is what we saw with Henry Molaison in anterograde amnesia. And basically, in early Alzheimer's, you know, your sensory memory is fine, your working memory is fine, um, your long-term memory is still intact, you, you remember your past, but what you have trouble with is taking new information from working memory and putting it into long-term memory. Uh, and we know that the hippocampus is uh, vital uh, for this process, and what we'll see in just a few slides is that the hippocampus is one of the first areas where there is neural degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's probably the first area uh, that is you know, attacked or, where, or damage accumulates, and that's why one of the hallmark symptoms of early Alzheimer's is issues with memory, specifically consolidating information from working memory to long-term memory. So with moderate Alzheimer's, again, there's a lot of flexibility to these stages, but individuals in a stage are unable to perform most activities of daily living, and long-term memory is now impaired. So it's not just having trouble getting things into long-term memory, but things that used to be in long-term memory uh, can be lost. Um, speech, reading, and writing, so language abilities, are, are progressively lost. They get worse and worse. Um, complex uh, movements are impaired, and the a big issue with this is is balance. Your balance can um, can decrease. Balance, obviously, a very complex task. And if you think about, say, an 85 year old with moderate Alzheimer's whose balance gets worse, you know, they could easily fall and break a hip, which has you know uh, can can quite have quite severe health consequences at that age. There begin to be behavioral issues that typically eventually necessitate transition from home care to long-term care facilities. Uh, some of those issues are wandering, irritability, resistance to caregiving, and outbursts of aggression. And these aren't normal uh, outbursts of aggression where something makes you mad and, and you're mad, but it, they can just be random. Uh, an individual with moderate Alzheimer's will uh, because their emotional centers are deteriorating, uh, they can have these outbursts you know, that aren't caused by anything. Now, advanced Alzheimer's, I don't know if, if, if it's appropriate to say that the, the good news here is that, thankfully, people are often very old when they get Alzheimer's, and it typically progresses slowly, so one typically dies of natural causes uh, before they have advanced uh, Alzheimer's. But uh, if it progresses fast enough and if you live long enough, uh, then you, you can uh, end up with uh, in these advanced stages. And here, you'd be completely dependent on caregivers. Um, there's a loss of verbal language. So you're, you're, you, you can still speak, but it might be reduced to you know, simple yeses and nos. Um, and, and um, emotional responses. Uh, there's extreme apathy and exhaustion, and it that's not just necessarily because um, this is a horrifying thing to experience, but because the the emotional centers of the brain are are um, are just so far uh, deteriorated and damaged. And again, uh, you don't die from Alzheimer's, but the what is often the cause of death are secondary complications. So uh, if uh, in this stage, your muscle mass can can deteriorate significantly to a point where you know you can't even lift a spoon, so you're bedridden, and that brings up a risk of things like um, dying of pneumonia or infection of of pressure uh, ulcers. So let's get to a little more about the the science behind Alzheimer's. So how do we diagnose uh, Alzheimer's? Well, one thing is that definite diagnosis to say 100% yes, you have Alzheimer's, it requires histochemical examination of brain tissue. So we need to get some brain tissue, we need to look at it under a microscope for um, abnormal protein folding, and we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Now that is not something that you would do on someone who's alive. You know, if someone's alive, you don't take a piece of their brain out unless 
you know, you um, unless um, it, it's required under you know extreme circumstances. So most individuals um, do not have a definite diagnosis of Alzheimer's because that would really be done post mortem. After the individual passes away, um, you could look at their brain tissue at that point. Uh, now with uh, my two uh, grandparents who had um, dementia and have passed away, you know that wasn't done. It's not typical to have an autopsy done on uh, on someone. But if if medical professionals want to know for sure was this Alzheimer's, you know that's what would have to be done. Now, brain imaging and blood tests are often used, but they're to rule out other types of dementia. So there are many reasons for dementia, and those other types of dementia, some of them have obvious signs that would show up in brain imaging or in blood tests. So basically, these tests are done on someone who has dementia to rule out other types of dementia, um, because some types of dementia actually can be treated. But basically, if all of those come back negative, then um, it it's, um, leads to the assumption that, well, it's probably Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that is combined with cognitive, functional, and behavioral assessment. And typically, um, the, the best way to do this is from a caregiver. Now, you can't rely on reports from the individual themselves because if they're having trouble with their long-term memory, then they don't have the best uh, report of their, their current experiences. And also, family members um, aren't the best either because you know they can be uh, a bit biased. So someone who is close to the individual, uh, a caregiver who has been with them you know, on, on, a, on a daily and hourly basis is often the, the best person to, uh, to assess about the, the individual's experiences. To assess cognition, a very common assessment is the mini mental state examination. So let's take a look at that. So it's a short test. Uh, you get a score out of 30, and it has a series of questions. So someone would be asking you these questions and, and recording the results. So for example, they would ask, you know, what is the year, you know, what season, the date, day of the week, a month, and you would get, you know, a point out of five, uh, or a point for each of those answers. Uh, and and it, you can see it goes on, and it, it's a, a series of, of simple tasks that involve uh, working memory and long-term memory. There are uh, typical um, scoring for the, the mini mental state exam. For scores you know, 24 to 30, that's suggesting no cognitive impairment, 18 to 23 mild cognitive impairment, and 0 to 17 severe cognitive impairment. So you'll notice it doesn't say anything here about dementia or Alzheimer's, and that's because this test is not specific to dementia or Alzheimer's, but uh, it can be used to detect many different types of cognitive impairment. So if you score low on this, it doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's. Uh, it, it could be um, that you have, uh, you're on the autistic uh, spectrum um, scale. There's also ways to adjust this scale based on the individual's education. So let's say you're testing one person who has a PhD. Well, then you'd probably use the, the normal scale. Uh, and then if you're testing someone who has um, you know, a grade eight education and you know, didn't really pursue uh, academic pursuits in the rest of their life, then you can adjust the scale so that it, to hopefully compensate a, a little bit for that. So let's talk about the neuropathology. And what happens is, overall, neurons of the brain die. And when they die, um, you know, they, they disappear and basically the brain atrophies. It, it withers away. So imagine a muscle, you know, you stop using it, those muscle cells, you know, they die off uh, and that muscle gets smaller. Well, with Alzheimer's, that's what we're kind of seeing in the brain, but it's from neuronal death. And it's typically uh, neurons in the cortex and some uh, regions of the subcortex. Uh, this image, this would be advanced Alzheimer's, this is fairly extreme, where we have a normal brain and in advanced Alzheimer's the, the neuronal loss or the decay uh, is so obvious that there's so much of it that um, the, the ventricles have enlarged and we're starting to see 
uh, you know, these, these holes appear in the brain because so much tissue has disappeared. Now, as I briefly mentioned before, one of the first areas of the brain where we see damage is the hippocampus. And we know the hippocampus uh, is vital for consolidating information from working to long-term memory. So that's why uh, one of the first hallmark symptoms is issues with remembering uh, recent information. Oops. So the hippocampus is damaged and we start to have uh, trouble consolidating information. Now this isn't as severe as anterograde amnesia because, so let's say you have 100% of your hippocampus, uh, then you have uh, Alzheimer's disease, you're in the early stages, and maybe 1% of your hippocampus is damaged, so 99% of it is still there. So if we think about it this way, you know, 99 times out of 100, information is consolidated perfectly from working memory to long-term memory. But you know, one time out of 100, uh, something goes wrong because that part of the hippocampus is damaged and you, that, that memory is lost. With anterograde amnesia with Henry Malaysen, you know he had 0% of the hippocampus, so there was no way to consolidate everything. But with Alzheimer's disease, what we see is that the hippocampus exists, it just begins to accumulate damage. And the further we progress in the disease, the more damaged it is, and the worse it, uh, it, it operates. Now Alzheimer's disease, the damage is not restricted to the hippocampus, that's where it begins, but it then spreads throughout the cortex and even other parts of the subcortex. And that's when we start to see you know, the other types of symptoms, like issues with language. You know, that's not damage to the hippocampus, that would be you know, Broca's area or Wernicke's area, we'll talk about those uh, later. And then uh, issues with emotion, um, that, if I remember correctly, would, would likely be the amygdala or other emotional processing centers. So what's happening? How is, how is this damage occurring? Well, Alzheimer's essentially is caused by protein misfolding. So down here we see a protein, and a critical aspect of proteins are the way they fold up. So, uh, you know, this is the protein kind of pulled apart, and but it, it has a way that it, it folds normally, and the way it's folded is vital for its function. If you unfold or denature a protein, it's not going to work anymore. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease, uh, disease are there, there are two proteins in the neurons that, for whatever reason, unfold, and they no longer work. And these are the amyloid beta protein and the tau proteins. And what we'll see is the amyloid beta proteins, when they unfold, uh, they also break off, form into these groups that we call plaques. So the, pro uh, the amyloid beta proteins cause plaques, and the tau proteins, they break apart, clump together, and they cause tangles. So the way I remember this is tau proteins has a T in it, and they're the ones that form the tangles. So here's the amyloid beta protein. And it's part of the amyloid uh, precursor protein, or, or, or the APP uh, molecule. Now, what does the amyloid precursor protein do? It has several functions. It's important for neuronal growth, survival, and post-injury repair. So obviously things that uh, are important for the brain. Now, what happens in Alzheimer's disease, uh, for whatever reason, we don't know exactly why, but the amyloid beta protein um, breaks off uh, and um, that, that, that this protein no longer works normally so that's problem number one because we're going to have issues with the neuron growing, surviving and, and recovering from, from injury so that's bad and then even worse these beta amyloid proteins they uh, happen to be sticky and other, other ones are breaking off and they come together and they form these plaques and these plaques uh, interfere with cellular or here neuronal function. So having extra things in your cell is not good. You know they get in the way. So one, the amyloid, uh, sorry, the uh, amyloid precursor protein can't do its normal function because it's broken apart. And two, these clumps or these plaques are getting in the way of the neuronal function. And when there's enough damage, uh, both of these things together uh, will lead to the death of the neuron. 
Now here's the tau protein, and the tau protein, uh, these, these, these um, little elements here, they're part of the neuron's transport system. So, you know, think of this like a, uh, like a tube, like a highway that's, that's delivering nutrients to the neuron, and it's held together by these tau proteins. They're kind of the glue that holds the tunnel together. And similar to the uh, amyloid uh, beta protein, we don't know why, but the tau proteins in Alzheimer's disease decide to let go. Uh, so they, they um, let go of, of, the, of the neuronal transport system. And this is a problem because they were the glue that held it together. So now the neuronal transport system is compromised. That's bad. And then again, the second bad thing is that these, these free floating tau proteins end up being sticky and when they find each other, they stick together and they form tangles. And again, tangles uh, get in the way of, of the neuron's function. So the good news about this is that we understand some of the mechanism of Alzheimer's disease. We understand it's because of these two proteins that de decide to uh, you know, <laughs> quit or or let go, uh, and that causes you know two problems for for each of these proteins. So there's a tremendous amount of research at looking at well, what is the signal that tells these these proteins to to misbehave? Because could we stop that signal? Uh, and there's other research that's looking into well, if we know we have these plaques and tangles, is there a drug that could uh, untangle those proteins or or help the cell to break them down to in essence say that hey this is garbage you know let's get rid of it um, so there's a, a tremendous amount of research looking at Alzheimer's disease uh, from several different angles because we understand a lot of the mechanism I'm not going to say all because we don't know why it is that these these proteins um, uh, decide to denature Go back here for a second. The other thing we see here uh, is, is this can also explain why this is a slowly progressive disease. So if you imagine uh, Alzheimer's disease at some point would start with just one protein um, that, that releases, it impairs uh, the neuronal function, and eventually more and more follow suit. And there's, there's never any repair uh, to this. So neurons die off you know, one by one. And at first, you know, if one neuron dies, you know, probably not a big deal, but eventually you've lost uh, a thousand or hundred thousand or say even a million and the, the symptoms will get worse and worse as more and more neurons die. So what's the genetics behind Alzheimer's disease? We know a bit about this too. So first of all, there are some deterministic genes for Alzheimer's. What, that, what those mean is that if you have this gene, as long as you live long enough, you will get, you will exhibit symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So if you have a deterministic gene, but you die at 10 for some other reason, then you know you would never exhibit Alzheimer's disease. But as long as you live long enough, uh, this gene ensures 100% you will uh, have Alzheimer's disease. This type of Alzheimer's from the determ deterministic gene is also quite severe. Uh, it's called familial or early onset Alzheimer's because individuals with this gene, uh, it's not in their 80s when they typically get symptoms, but it's in their early 40s uh, or mid 50s. And uh, if that's not bad enough, the rate of progression also typically uh, tends to be faster. This type of Alzheimer's is extremely rare. It's less than 1% of people with Alzheimer's. And if you have this gene, you would likely know it because everyone in your family and in your genetic lineage would also have it. Um, I guess it's possible that you could have it as a, as a, a random mutation or a variation, uh, but it's typically restricted to um, you know generations of individuals who have had this uh, throughout their family. Uh, it, there's different uh, genes that that can cause this. Um, but the, the more common, by far, uh, presents, well, the more common form of, of Alzheimer's does not have a deterministic gene, so you can't get a test that says, you know, are you going to have Alzheimer's disease, but uh, 
there are some genes that are associated with a risk of Alzheimer's. So if you have these genes, and it gets a little complex, we'll talk about it, but they typically increase your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. So it doesn't mean you, you will or you won't, but your risk is increased. An example of this, uh, the most common one, is the, uh, I'm not sure if I can say this right, but the apolipoprotein e E4, or APOE4, as it's often uh, referred to. So APOE4, uh, it's on chromosome 19, and there are three common alleles, uh, and they're, they're quite simply named E2, E3, and E4. These percentages are their occurrence in the population. So E3 is the most common. Um, E4 is the second most common, but far less common, and E2 is um, the most rare. I'm, I'm not sure there might also be some other, other but these are, are the three big ones. I'm, I'm not a geneticist. Now, the risk is associated if you have uh, the E4 allele. So, if you have one APOE4, so you would have, have two of these, you know, one from your mother, one from your father, and if you have one E4 and the other one is, say, E2 or E3, then you have five times risk of developing Alzheimer's. So your risk would be five times higher than someone who doesn't have any E4s. So maybe someone has two E2s, two E3s, or a two and a three. Um, those individuals are five times less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, worst case is if you have two E4s, and in that case, your risk of Alzheimer's increases 20 times higher than an individual who doesn't have any E4 alleles. It's not actually that quite, it's not quite that simple. It's complex. So there is a bit of a sex difference depending on whether you're male or female. And even more confusingly, uh, there are interactions with ethnicity. So let me give you an example. If you are Nigerian black, then in that uh, ethnicity, E4 is actually the most common allele. So in, in the rest of the world, on average, E3 is the most common. For Nigerian blacks, E4 happens to be the most common. So you would think that they would have uh, an increased risk of Alzheimer's compared to other ethnicities. But Alzheimer's is actually very uncommon in Nigerian blacks. So it's not just the E4 that determines the risk, which is very confusing and, and makes it difficult to study because this is interacting with ethnicity uh, and also interacting with, with sex. So the story is, is quite complex here. And it's, it's definitely beyond my ability to appreciate uh, as a cognitive psychologist. If you've ever looked at genetic tests before, you may have seen that some of them, typically the, the more expensive version, so for 23andMe there's a, a basic version, and then there's, there's the one uh, that also uh, says it tests uh, genetic health risks. And you can see here, it, it looks for late onset Alzheimer's disease. So basically, what I believe they're looking at would be the APOE4 allele. And uh, they're looking at, do you have one or two of these alleles? Um, so it's not early onset Alzheimer's, it's not looking for deterministic genes, um, but it would look for APOE4, which is probably the one that, that, that more people would be interested in. Uh, I haven't had this, this test done, uh, it's an interesting ethical question of, you know, do you want to know? Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> and especially because it's not deterministic, uh, because it just changes your, your probability, and, uh, you know, it depends on things like ethnicity. Uh, and I don't know, maybe for me it's, it's better not to know, um, but, well, you can, you can think about that. Uh, on your own. If you're ever uh, curious about doing one of these, I, I will let you know, and you might know yourself, that every holiday season uh, these genetic tests go on sale often, you know, for half price. So if you're if you're really interested, uh, you you can wait, uh, or I suggest waiting to that time to get uh, a bit of a deal. There are also lots of issues uh, with with how these these tests are done. But if you want to know more about that, I think Vox has a great uh, video about it that you can find on on YouTube.
Okay, last up for Alzheimer's disease is the issue of uh, prevention. And it, again, there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, treatments that uh, exist are largely just to treat the symptoms. We unfortunately don't have anything that can uh, stop, slow, or re reverse uh, the, 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 the protein misfolding uh, and the damage to the neurons. That's you know, a huge goal uh, for the future. But the good news is that intellectual activities, physical activity, and healthy diet are all correlated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. So this is correlation. It doesn't mean uh, it, there's, it doesn't mean it's a cause and effect. You can be the most intellectually active, physically active, healthiest diet uh, individual on, on the planet, and you might still get uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's just a correlation. But I think it's good to, to, to know this uh, because as kinesiologists, one thing that we're trying to promote are healthy lifestyles. And um, people are, are probably quite aware that um, you know, a healthy lifestyle can help your energy levels, that it can help um, decrease re your risk of um, uh, respiratory issues, um, you know, muscle wasting, or um, you know, vascular issues like stroke or, or heart disease. But we can also add to that list uh, that it reduces your risk uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that's, that's great. That's you know, more good news in support of, of pursuing a healthy lifestyle. So with that, we'll end this module on exceptional memory.